Hi guys, welcome back to our week three meeting. Uh, I see we have many people here. Amy is here, uh, Condra is here, and then Jenna and Gali. All right, so let's get started. Um, guys, I haven't updated your actual credit for exam two yet. Uh, I'll probably do that sometime today. So if by tomorrow, let's say tomorrow noon, if you check your uh, exam two grade, if you don't see any extra points on there, send me an email. Uh, let me know. I can update it on my site as soon as possible. Okay. So um. So let's get started. We'll cover three chapters today, just like before. Uh, we'll cover chapter, uh, what is it now? Chapters 13, 14, and 15. And then uh, just like before, I'll post the other three chapters online so you can look at at home later on. Okay, so let me do my screen sharing. And then guys, remember, uh, if you have any questions during the lecture, just uh, post your questions in the chat box and I'll answer them as soon as I it, okay? All right, so chapter 13, uh, we're talking about the cost of production. Um, now, the thing with chapter 13, uh, 14, and 15, there are a lot of calculations to do. So make sure you know how to do the formulas. And then it's also a good idea to use Excel for chapters 13, 14, and 15. So if you guys want, when you listen to this lecture, open the Microsoft Excel next to the, um, next to the video so you can work on the um, calculations on Excel. Okay, so chapter 13. All right, so revenue. Um, revenue is how much company are collecting from customers. And you can also think revenue as how much cash you have in your cash register. So every time you sell anything and you're getting money from your, from your customers, that, rev that, that money before you pay for your own cost, that's your revenue. Um, cost is anything to do with production and sales. And then if you use your revenue minus cost, that's your profit. Uh, so revenue is how much money you have in, in the register, and then profit is how much money you can take home at the end of the day. So after you pay all the costs, that's your profit. Um, and then the goal of every single company uh, is to maximize the profit. Now, when we say maximizing profit, we don't mean maximizing revenue. And then really, in many situations, if you try to maximize your revenue, you might be having a lower profit. Um, so for example, let's say we want to sell some iPhones. Um, if you try to maximize your revenue, then you, sell the, you will sell the iPhone at whatever the price. Now, however, let's say we have a customer, and this customer's uh, WTP, remember the willingness to pay, so this customer's WTP is only $50 for the iPhone. Now, if we sell the iPhone to this one, one customer uh, for $50, our revenue does increase. But the cost of iPhone is more than $50. So if you sell the iPhone for $50, you're actually losing money, so which means your profit is getting smaller. So, if, so, so many times, if you just try to increase your revenue, it doesn't mean that you're increasing your profit. So the goal of every single company is not to increase revenue or decrease cost, but to maximize our profit, okay? Uh, two costs over here, so explicit cost and implicit cost. Uh, explicit cost is anything that require uh, money, so when you pay for the bills, when you pay for employees, that's your explicit cost. And an implicit cost is any cost that doesn't require money, so uh, opportunity cost or time for the for the company owners, those would be all implicit cost. Let me see. All right, this two are important, and I do believe this is on your um, quiz and test. So the difference between accounting profit and economic profit. So accounting profit is your total revenue minus your total explicit cost. So how much you pay out of money, um, that's your accounting profit. And then your economic profit is your total revenue minus your total cost which is your explicit and implicit cost. Um, so because this um, economic profit, they are also subtracting your implicit cost. So your economic profit is always more than your accounting profit. So sometimes um, the a company might have a positive accounting profit, but they might have a, a negative economic profit. Um, so let's suppose, um, who should use the example? Let's say Justin Bieber. 
So suppose Justin Bieber decided to quit his music career. So no more music from Justin Bieber. And I decided to open um, a chicken fried rice business. Okay. And let's suppose that for the entire year he did pretty good. So for the entire year after he paid all the all the employees, all the chickens, all the rice, all the rent, the after he paid for everything, his accounting profit by the end of the year, let's say is ten thousand dollars. Now sounds pretty good. But Justin Bieber also have his opportunity cost, which is how much money he's giving up on the his you know the money he's making from his music careers. So let's suppose his his implicit cost is one million dollar. Then in this case over here, his accounting profit is ten thousand, but his economic profit will be the the ten thousand minus the one million dollar. Then he's actually losing nine hundred ninety thousand dollars. So, so in this case, in his situation, his accounting profit is positive, but his economic profit is negative. So remember, guys, that for the economic profit, you have this extra piece of implicit cost. So, which means that your economic profit is always less. Well, what did I say more? <laughs> Should be less. Less than accounting profit. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. Okay, so production function. Production function shows the relationship between the quantity of input used to produce a good and the quantity of output of that good. Uh, and in most of the examples you have in this chapter, uh, the production function, so the production function is just a function of labor and capital. And more than often, you see the labor over here. So it's how many labor do you require to produce a certain number of goods? That's your production function. Uh, for example, then we have farmer Jack here, and Jack grow wheat, and then he has five acres of land, and he can hire as many workers as he wants. And remember, for every worker you hire, you have to pay for the worker's salary. So that's your labor cost. All right, so for our production function, uh, if Jack hires zero workers, so with nobody working, then you don't have any production, so quantity is zero. And then if you hire one worker, your production is 1,000. Two people, production 1,800. Three, 2,400. Four, 2,800. And then five, 3,000. So this line over here is our production function. So it shows you how many workers do you have and how much production do you have. Uh, marginal product is the um, is the increasing output arising from additional unit of input holding all other input constant. Um, to to look at another way, uh, the simpler way, um, the marginal product is just that if you hire one more worker, how many more output do you have? So let's look at this table over here. The when we have zero workers, we have zero output. But once you hire one worker, your output will become 1,000. So the marginal product of the first worker here, so MP, that's your marginal product, for the first worker is 1,000 unit of wheat. And then for the second worker, so the difference between 1,000 to 1,800, that's your 800 uh, wheat. And then third one is 600. Next one's 400. And last one is 200. So the marginal product of labor is just how many additional output you have by hiring one more worker. So for every extra worker you hire, how many more output do you have? That's called a marginal product of labor. And that's a formula for it. So remember the triangle stands for change. So change in quantity over change in labor. Um, Guys, let me show you how to do this on Excel. Because um, on Excel, this is a very simple function. Let me show you how to do that. And when you guys are working on the problems for chapters 13, 14, 15, um, Excel will definitely help you. Okay. All right, so we have labor on the first column, quantity, second column. And then MPL, marginal part of labor. A bigger.
All right, so the marginal part of labor, you can just use um, the current level minus the previous level. That's your marginal part of labor. Um, and then one thing you guys need to know for Excel spreadsheet that every time you put in a formula, always start with the equal sign. So the equal sign is like a command. It's telling Excel that whatever come after the equal sign, you calculate this for me. Okay, so the first one, and then for the second one, just use your 1800. So just click on the number, minus the 1000, and they give you answer of 800. Um, and then there is a shortcut here. So once you put in the first formula in the Excel spreadsheet, uh, what you can do, go to the right bottom corner here. You see how the mouse changed the little black plus sign? Um, click on it, drag it down. There, everything's all calculated. So it's a very, it's a little sh good shortcut to have when you work on the homeworks. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Ah, this one's important. So I'm going to diminish a marginal product. Um, let's go back to the graph over here. Now, if you notice, that's why our MPL is getting smaller, 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 smaller. So eventually, MPL might just become zero. That means if you hire one more worker, you wouldn't have any additional output. And the reason why it's getting smaller, smaller, smaller is because, um, guys, imagine this. Imagine for this farm land over here, we only have five acres. So if you hire one or two worker, and then you are very productive, your production does increase. But imagine if you hire you know, 100 worker, then it wouldn't make that much a difference if you hire 101, because you know you only have a limited number of land. So this this uh, this decreasing marginal product, we call this the diminishing law of marginal product. The, the marginal product of input, so the additional production of a worker declines as the quantity of worker increases. The more worker you hire, the less efficient each additional worker becomes. Now, the only way to fix this is to increase everything else as well. So once you, uh, so if you want to, if you want to keep a, a constant marginal product, uh, not only should you increase your number of workers, you also need to increase the number of capitals and your number of land. So everything else also increase at the same rate, then your marginal product will be stay constant. But otherwise, if you just if you just increase labor by itself, then the marginal part of labor becomes smaller, 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 smaller. And eventually become zero. And if you go even further, it will become negative. So you can actually become less efficient as the entire company if you hire too many workers. I mean, imagine for the five acre land, we hire 10,000 workers, then what's going to happen? Right? Become overcrowded. Everybody standing around can't do anything. So the production becomes really small, tiny. So in, th in those cases, you have this diminishing marginal product. Uh, for cost over here, uh, so we have our cost of land. So it's not, we have a, a fix of five acres. So the cost of land never changes. So this cost of land stay constant. Um, and then we have a cost of labor. Now cost of labor, this one depends on our number of labors. So for every worker, um, the cost of labor is $2,000. So for zero workers, zero dollars, uh, one worker, two thousand, two workers, two, uh, four thousand, and so on and so forth. So your total cost, you're going to use your cost of land plus cost of labor. That's your total cost here. Now, if you graph this, um, this would be your total cost. Cost, a change in total cost over changing quantity. Now, guys, I will show you how to do this on Excel spreadsheets. It's very simple. Um, what it shows you, it just shows you that for to produce one more unit, how much additional cost do you have to produce one more unit? So for the first level over here, our to change in total cost is 2,000. Change in quantity is 1,000. So the marginal cost is $2. And then for the next one, change in total cost is 2,000. But changing quantity is 800 now, so your marginal cost is 250. And then next one will be $3 to 33 cents, $5, and then $10. So the marginal cost here 
is increasing as the more and more you produce. And this also goes back to the diminishing marginal product. Is that because the your production become less efficient, so the, the the marginal cost of every production, every additional production, become every more expensive. And that's how the marginal cost curve looks like. All right, so this is important. So different between the uh, a fixed cost and a variable cost. Now a fixed cost is um, what do you have to pay regardless of how much you produce. Um, and then variable cost, this one will changes and depends on how much you produce. So suppose I, I want to open a business. And let's say my business, I want to do a chicken and fried rice business. Um, so let's see, let's look at what, we, what do we need. Uh, we need chicken. We need rice. So this is just the basic stuff, right? Uh, we need labor. We need utilities. And we need to pay our rent. Now, let's suppose for this month, um, then my 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 production increase, so I produce more chicken fried rice. Now, does it need to I need to buy more chicken? Sure, right. So the the cost of chicken will increase if I produce more chicken fried rice. And then what about rice? Same thing, right? If I produce more chicken fried rice, I need more rice as well. Um, and I also need to hire more labor. And I need to pay more for utility. But this rent over here, this will stay constant. Because my landlord doesn't care about how much chicken fires are produced. All they care about is that I pay my rent at the end of the month. So rent wouldn't change regardless of how much production you have. Therefore, for rent, um, we have a name for it. It's right here. I know it's hard to see, but rent is called a fixed cost. So it doesn't change regardless of how much you produce. And then your variable cost, this is your chicken, your rice, your labor utility, those does change when you produce more or less. And then your total cost is your fixed cost plus variable cost. All right, let's get this. Let me talk about this. Um, all right, and then a couple more formulas. So average average fixed cost, it is a fixed cost divided by quantity. So you know, for the first one, one hundred divided by one is one hundred, and then one hundred divided by two that's fifty, and then so on and so forth. Okay, um, let me see. Variable cost, oh, the average variable cost, that's your variable cost divided by quantity. So variable cost divided by quantity, that's your average variable cost. See, and then your average total cost is your total cost divided by quantity. But there's also one more way to find average total cost. Um, the other way is your average total cost equals to your average variable cost plus average fixed cost. Okay, they also give you the average total cost. Um, one more thing you guys need to keep in mind that um, now if you look at this graph over here, the orange curve is our marginal cost curve. And then notice where the marginal cost curve is intersecting with your, um, this is your average variable cost curve. And this is your average total cost curve. So wherever your marginal cost curve is intersecting with those two curves, these two points, they're also the minimum point of each curve. So the intersection of marginal cost curve and, and A, your average total cost curve, that's the minimum for average total cost. And then when the marginal cost is intersecting with the, with the average variable cost, variable, variable cost curve, that's your minimum average variable cost. All right, um, let's see if you can finish this table over here. Um, all right, let's start from the top. Um, so on the first column here, when the production is zero, um, our total cost is 50, and then we need to know what is our variable cost. Now remember we said before, we said uh, our total cost equals to variable cost plus fixed cost. Um, but we don't know what the fixed cost is. 
Now, however, um, if you remember the definition for fixed cost is that um, regardless of how much you produce, you're gonna pay for your fixed cost. So if your production is zero, then your variable cost is zero. Because if you don't produce any, if you don't produce anything, then you shouldn't have any variable cost. And then which means your fixed cost is just 50. So total cost minus variable cost gets your fixed cost. And then next level, um, the produce one, our variable cost is 10. And then total cost, now for the for the 50 over here, this number never changed. So the, the fixed cost is always 50. Go back. The fixed cost is always 50. So 10 plus 50, that gives you 60. And then your average fixed cost, so be, uh, 50 divided by one, that's a 50. And then the next one is asking for what's your marginal cost over here. So marginal cost is the change in total cost here. So from 60 to 80, the marginal cost is 20. Um, and then your average fixed cost is 50 divided by two, so 25. And then average variable cost is 30 divided by two, that's a 15. And the average total cost is 40 divided by two, that's a 40. I mean, 80 divided by two, that's a 40. And then next one, um, our, we know the total cost, we know the marginal cost. So the, for the total cost over here is 80 plus 30, that's 110. Now the other way to do it, if you use the average total cost times three, they'll get, they will also get you a total cost of 110. And then your variable cost, uh, 110 minus 50, so 60, that's your variable cost. And you can also use your average variable cost 20 times the three here, that also get you 60. Um, okay, so next one, the marginal cost here from 110 to 140, the different, the 150, difference is 40. And then we have um, variable cost 100, quantity is four, and an average variable cost will be 25. Um, let me see, next one over here, we don't know what the total cost is, but we need we, we have the variable cost. So the variable cost plus fixed cost, total cost is 200. And an average fixed cost, uh, there will be 50 divided by five, so it's 10. And the average total cost is 200 divided by five, this is a 40. And then marginal cost here is the difference between 200 and 50, that's a 50. All right, so that's how you do it, okay? Uh, does anybody have any question at this point right now? No questions? No question that's interesting. Um, this part is not really important. If you know the definitions for what it is, you'll be fine on the test. Okay. Uh, this is important. So for the long run average total cost curve, uh, the for the portion of your long run average total cost, if this is decreasing, this is called economy of scale. Uh, if it's the same, this is called constant return to scale. And then if you are if your uh, long run average total cost is increasing, this is called DC economy of scale. And then many times when company try to merge with one another, uh, they will use the economy of scale as an argument. Now what that means is just, just means that if you merge two companies together, they can share some of the costs they have. So which means the company become more efficient. So one example you can think of, uh, and you imagine if we, if we merge 18 team with uh, T-Mobile, now, um, to run two companies, you need two CEO. But to run one company, you only need one CEO. So at least for the salary of the CEO, we can use economy of scale. Because when two companies merge together, we only need to pay for one CEO, which means uh, the cost goes slower and the production become more efficient. So that's called economy of scale, okay? So it's a, a decreasing in your long run average total cost curve. Yes. That's it for this chapter. Um, does anybody have any question at this point right now?
All right, with no questions, let's move on to the next chapter, chapter 14. All right, so chapter 14, uh, I want to start talking about the four different types of market structure. And then chapter 14 is the first one. It's called a perfectly competitive market. Um, so we talked about this in chapter four before. Um, we talked about what is a perfectly competitive market. Um, now, if you guys imagine that if, when you guys go buy uh, the paper for your printer, do you care about which brand paper you buy? Not really, right? Because they're all the same white paper. So that will be called a perfectly competitive market. So to be called a perfectly competitive market or perfect competition, it must satisfy three criteria. So the first one, that you have many buyers and many sellers. So when you go to this market over here, you have many goods to choose from. And then every single good offered by each company, they are the same. So, um, so there's no difference between this, this brand of white paper or the other brand of white paper. And the last one is that firms, uh, so company in this market, they are free to enter and they are free to exit. And then because the, you have many, many companies in the market over here and then everybody sell the same good, we call each company or each, and also each seller, each buyer where the price taker. That means you take what the price is already set, you cannot set your own price. So imagine that you're the, you're the new company in town and you try to sell your printer paper. So you go to Walmart and then you, you want to sell it more expensive. So everybody sell the paper for $2 per pack and then you sell yours for $3 per pack. Now, once you do that, nobody will buy from you because your paper is the same thing as everybody else. But that's one of the conditions for perfect competition. So, so if, you sell for, if you sell for $3, nobody buy from you that means eventually you're gonna lower the price from three back to $2. So you cannot set your own price. You have to take what the price is already set for you. All right, uh, we'll talk about this before, uh, but a couple more formulas. So your total revenue, remember this is how much money you have in your cash register, that equals to your price times quantity, that's your total revenue. Average revenue uh, is your total revenue divided by quantity, which is just equal to your price. And the marginal revenue is your change in total revenue divided by change in quantity. So for this table over here, um, the, the total revenue, remember we said this is P times Q. So this would be um, 0, 10, 20, 30. And the average revenue, um, is your total revenue divided by quantity. So this will be 20 divided by two, that's a 10. 30 divided by three, that's a 10. 40 divided by four, that's a 10. And last one's also 10. So we, within this four marketplace, you guys will notice this, that your, your price is always equal to your average revenue. Now, marginal revenue is the change in total revenue over change in quantity. Now, luckily, our change in quantity is always one. So whatever change in total revenue, that will be the answer. So the first level will be 10. So from 0 to 10 is 10. Second one from 0 to 20, that's also 10. And then 20 to 30, 10. 30 to 40, 10. Uh, so in this case here, that our price is equal to average revenue is equal to marginal revenue. Now, guys, this is only true for companies in perfect competition. If you look at any other company, this would be, wouldn't be true, okay? So only in perfect competitions with the price equal to average revenue and also equal to margin revenue. So companies always think about, you know, to maximize profit. And then, um, guys, I want you to remember this. To maximize profit, all we're going to do is to set where the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. That's when your profit is maximized. So let's look at this example over here. Um, 
So your total cost is given to you 5, 9, 15, 20, 30, 33, 45. And then profit uh, is your total revenue minus total cost. That's your profit. So for the first one, 0 minus 5, that's a negative 5. Second one, 10 minus 9, that's 1. And then 20 minus 15, 5. 30 minus 23, 7. And then 7 again, and then 5 again. Um, and then for the marginal cost, it's the difference in each level of cost over here. So for the first one is four dollars. Second one difference is going to be six. Third one difference is eight. Next one difference is ten. Last one difference is twelve. Um, and then your change in profit. So for the first one, our change in profit is six dollars. Uh, second one change in profit is four dollars. That's your Marginal revenue minus marginal cost, and next one change in profit is two dollars, and then zero, and then minus two dollars. Now, if you try to maximize your profit, what you try to do is look for where the marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Wherever this happens, your profit is maximized. So, it looks like at this level here, our marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So, which means that between this quantity, so either three or four. That our profit is maximized at seven unit. So that's how you find out the profit maximization is wherever the marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. And then to draw this on the graph here, uh, let's see. So wherever the, the two line intersect, at this point, let's call it Q, I don't know, QC. At QC, your, your, your profit is maximized. Now, however, if you didn't set your production at QC, and suppose you, your production is at this point right here, now, if you're producing at QA, that your, your marginal revenue is more than marginal cost, that means company can make more revenue than the the cost that's associated producing this good. So companies should produce this good and produce more of this good. But if you, at this point of the curve, so let's say this is QD, um, at QD, your marginal cost is more than marginal revenue. That means you shouldn't produce this good at all. I mean, imagine it costs your company $5 to produce one pencil, but once you produce it, you can only sell for $3. Then why even do it, right? So if your marginal cost is more than, more than marginal revenue, then you shouldn't produce this good. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Okay. Uh, notice, I think this is on your um, chapter assignment for chapters 14. So shut down. Um, the, in the short run, if your price is less than your average variable cost, you should shut down. Um, and then exit, that means if your price is less than average total cost in the long run, you exit. So let me give you an example here. Now remember we, 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 we said we're going to open a business for chicken fried rice, right? And then imagine the, the average variable cost. So between all the chicken, all the rice, all the laborers, all the utility, that for every order we make, it costs our company five dollars, and then if so, that's your average variable cost. Now, if your price is only four dollars, then you shouldn't produce this good. And then, really, if you produce this good, the more you produce it, the more loss you have because it costs you five, you sell for four. Then why do you even do it? So if this happens, the company will shut down. That means don't even open this restaurant; just just close it and then pay for your rent. Um, now, however, in the long run, then uh, if you're factoring your, your fixed cost, if your price is less than average total cost, that means you, you're losing money here. Then in the long run, you shouldn't even open at all in the long run. So when it's next time to renew your lease with your landlord, don't even renew the lease because you're losing money every single month. Just tell the landlord, I'm sorry, I'm going to close down. Okay, so gonna, you're going to exit the market. So short run, if a price less than ABC, you shut down. Long run, if your price less than ATC, you exit the market. And the difference between long run and short run here is that in the short run, you still have a fixed cost. 
that you still got to pay for your uh, for your for your rent, but in the long run, that you don't you don't have this fixed cost anymore. That in the long run, even your fixed cost become variable because you have a chance to renew the lease, so you have a chance to get out of the lease now. So your lease become flexible. All right. Um, shut down if your price less than ABC. So this definition, some cost, the cost has already already be committed and cannot be recovered. That's a sum cost. Um, let's see what else is important. All right, so to find profit, um, guys, when you look at the graph like this, um, when looking for the company, either profit or loss, the first point looking for is always where the marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. So that's your first point looking for. And second point from this point here, go down to your quantity, and this is your second point. So this is the quantity that will maximize your profit. And then your third point from the quantity, go up to your average total cost curve. That is your third point, because from this point you have your ATC. So it looks like this in this graph over here, our ATC is six. And then the fourth point, go back to the price line or the demand curve. So this line here, which is also our demand curve, this is the price of the good. So the profit, profit equals to your price minus your ATC times your quantity. So price is ten dollars. Um, ATC is six. So this vertical distance times your quantity, this horizontal distance. So which means this rectangle here. That is the profit for the company. And then again to find the profit. Uh, so let's do the math here. So 10 minus 6 times 50. So that's 4 times 50 and profit just 200. Okay, got it? Now, let's look at another situation. Uh, so again, the first thing we're looking for is where the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. So this is the first point looking for. And then second point, go get your quantity. That's your second point. Third point, go to your ATC curve, get your ATC, that's your $5 for ATC. So average total cost. And a fourth point, go back, get your price line. So $3 is your price. So profit is three minus five times 30. So that's a minus 16. So this area here is the loss of the company. So we don't make profit, actually losing money here. So anytime if your average total cost is above your price line, then this company is losing money. And then vice versa, that if your average total cost curve uh, is below the price line, then the company is making a profit, okay? Let me see what else is important. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, is that for your for companies in perfect competition, um, this is your demand curve. So the demand curve for perfect com for companies in per perfect competition is perfectly horizontal. Now this is only true for companies in perfect competition. Then if you go look at any other companies in other market structure, that your demand curve will be downward sloping. But only for perfect competitions the individual company demand curve is downward sloping. Um, but for the market demand curve, the market demand curve still have a, uh, a downward sloping demand curve. Um, now, in the long run, in the long run for companies in perfect competition, then you're gonna have zero profit. Now, the reason why that is, um, so suppose, just suppose, suppose that we have this perfect competition market. Um, let's suppose it's the market for printer papers. And then suppose right now there's only one company making the papers and then they're making a huge amount of profit. What do you suppose other company will do? 
they want to join the market, right? They want to compete with this existing company. So when you have more company competing in the same marketplace, uh, the price will go down. When the price goes down, then your your profit goes away. So in the long run, that for companies in perfect competition, you are just making zero economic profit. So you are just breaking even. Okay. Uh, if you make a profit, other company will join in, which lower the price and profit goes away. And then if some company is losing money, then those company will exit the market. Once they exit the market, price goes back up because you have less competition now. So with less competition, price increase, price increase, then the loss goes away. And then eventually we're again just breaking even. Okay. All right. Um, let's see what else is important. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. Um, does anybody have any question regarding the chapter 14? You guys are awfully quiet today. All right, guys, uh, no question. Let's move on to the last chapter for today, um, chapter 15, Monopoly. Now, you you all played the game before, right? So the board game Monopoly. Uh, so to win the game at Monopoly, you need to be the last company standing. So you own all the properties. You're the only company in town. Then you become Monopoly, and then you win the game. So for Monopoly here, um, it's a very simple definition. It just means you have one company who dominate the marketplace and there are no closed substitute for this good, we call this a monopoly. Now, we don't have that many monopoly in the marketplace, um, but you know, one example we can think of, that if you live in the Houston area, that if you want to get some natural gas for your house, and the only company to go for is Center Point. So that's a monopoly, because you don't have any other choice. There's no other company in town providing, providing natural gas for you. So it's only Center Point, that's why it's a monopoly. And then for the monopoly, the key difference between monopoly and a perfect competition, is that for monopoly, the comp the, this one company has market power to set its own price and quantity. In perfect competitions, company doesn't have any market power. But in monopoly, because you're only one company in town, then this one company can set its own price and quantity. So we call this the market power for the company. Um, I mean, guys, give me one second, let me grab a cup of water, okay? All right, um, so for a monopoly to stay as a monopoly, there must be some kind of barrier to enter. That means no other company can join the marketplace, and we are all, so in this market, there's only one company, and forever it is one company. So there are a couple, a couple sources of barrier to entry. Uh, the first one is that if the if the company owns the key resource, then this company is the monopoly for this market. So one example they have uh, this company called De Beer. De Beer owns over 80% of all the world diamond mines. So if you buy a diamond uh, that's coming from De Beer, so that's a monopoly because no other company own any diamond mine. Um, and then the second one is that sometimes the government might, might issue exclusive right to produce good to a single company. So uh, center point is actually um, um, a government control monopoly. So does does the government allow this monopoly to happen? 
And then last one is called natural monopoly. Is that uh, is more efficient to have one company um, to service the entire market compared to several several other smaller companies. Um, and then we can also use the center points one more time. For example, so um, so if you try to provide um, natural gas uh, in Houston and then you're a new company, now you need to build the pipes to connect to each house. So, so this is very inefficient because we don't we don't need two pipes for each house, only need one pipe. Therefore, it's, that's why it's more efficient to have one company to service the entire market compared to more than one company. So that's called natural monopoly. Um, right, so remember we said before that for companies in perfect competition, your demand curve is perfectly horizontal. But for any other companies, your demand curve is a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. All right. So let's let's try this one. Um, so your total revenue is your price times quantity. So zero four dollars, and then this would be seven, nine, ten, ten, and nine dollars. And then average revenue is your total revenue divided by quantity. So four divided by one is four dollars. Seven divided by two is three fifty. Um, and then next one nine divided by three is three dollars. Ten divided by four two fifty. And then two and then dollar fifty. So your your average revenue is just equal to price. And then for the margin revenue, it's a change in each level of total revenue. So for the first one is four dollars, second one uh, this would be three dollars, two one zero minus one. So you see that the, for this monopoly here, that our margin revenue doesn't equal to price and average revenue anymore. So so the the price equal to AR and the MR. This is only true for companies in perfect competition. For monopoly, this is no longer true. Okay. And then one more thing you can notice that see how the the margin revenue this column here is always less than the price. So when when we draw the line, you see it more clearly. The demand curve, that's your margin revenue curve. So because your margin revenue curve, the margin revenue is always always less than your price lap price line, the margin revenue curve is always below your demand curve. And then wherever the margin revenue curve is equal to zero, this point here, at this point, um, your total revenue is maximized. Okay. This. Okay. So like we said before, you try to determine what is your profit for the company. So four points. The first point is where the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. So that is your first, oh, right here. Marginal cost, here we go. This is the first point we have. Marginal cost, marginal revenue. Second point, get your quantity. So that's our second point. Third point, go to your ATC curve, get your ATC. Fourth point, get your demand curve, get your price. So for this company here, the profit is this area right here. So price minus ATC times quantity, that's your profit. Guys, know what's a price discrimination? Uh, that's when companies selling the same good to different consumer for different price. That's a price discrimination. Um, we we have price discriminations um, all the time. You guys might not even notice this. Um, I mean, even right now, at this time right now, if you go to the mall, many stores has like huge um, sales, right? So those actually a price discrimination. Because they are selling the same good at different time for different prices. 
that's called price discrimination. Okay, so price dis discrimination is legal as long as, as you don't discriminate based on you know gender, age, sex, and those other categories. All right, we can skip this. Not important. Oh, so know this one. We do have some policy toward monopolies. Um, the monopoly, even though you can, for any, for every company, you want to be a monopoly because once you're a monopoly, you can set your own price. You have a, you have a more market power. Um, but monopoly is very very inefficient in the marketplace because with monopoly, uh, price become higher and then our total surplus become lower. So we do have some laws against monopoly. So if you guys look, if you guys go look up in your history book for the Sherman Antitrust Act and also the Clayton Act, so those are some policy and laws we have against monopoly. So anytime if a company become too big, we do use the Sherman Antitrust Law to break them up. Uh, the last time we did it was back in 1972 when we broke up the company called AT T into AT T and South Western Bell. So uh, when the company can become too big, we do use this antitrust law to break them up into smaller, more competitive companies. All right, uh, so that's it for this chapter. Um, does anybody have any question at this point? Let me wait for a second. We do have a delay here. And then, guys, um, I will post your extra quarters for chapter two um, later tonight. So by tomorrow morning or tomorrow noon, if you don't see any change in your exam too great, uh, let me know. I probably just missed yours. Okay, so let me know. Send me an email. I will update your grade uh, as soon as I see your email. All right. Uh, anybody have any questions? All right, guys, if no questions, let's end it today here. Um, I will see you guys same time here next week. So next Tuesday, um, 2 p.m., we're going to have our last meeting, OK? So guys, make sure to do your discussions. And remember to get full credit for discussions. You need to reply to your classmates' discussions as well. Um, and then don't forget to do your exam three and then your assignments. Now keep in mind that Monday is New Year's Day, so, uh, so your assignments are due I believe that man so next Monday that's that's when the sun is due. Okay. So if I have any question let me know and then uh good luck and have a happy new year. I will see you guys in twenty seventeen. Bye bye.